So tonight's talk is one of those ones that is going to be fairly straightforward academically. But it's probably going to hit you maybe harder than you thought. Um, so just give you a heads up about that. And here's why. If you've begun to understand a couple things about complex trauma or complex PTSD, is that there's really two things that a child can't resolve. So the first thing is they have these needs, need for love, for nurture, for acceptance, for validation, all of that, and it's not getting met consistently. And they try to get it met and it's still not being met. And that unmet need is very painful for them. It, it's frustrating, it's hard. So an unresolved need then causes the child to feel all alone, nobody cares for me, must be my fault, I don't feel safe, and that's complex trauma. The second thing is unresolved pain, unresolved danger. And so again, the child tries to get the danger out of the way, tries to get resolved the painful emotion, and they can't. And so after a while, it's like, what do I do? What do I do? I can't resolve this pain. And so two unresolved things really cause a child to feel all alone, must be my fault, unsafe, and that is ongoing trauma. So what that leads to, and here's what we're going to focus on tonight, is when a child has an unmet need or has unresolved pain, they will then adapt. And that's the key word for tonight, is a child adapts. So trauma is all about adapting in order to try and get your needs met or in order to try to take the pain away. So it's adapt, adapt, adapt. Adapt in order to survive is really what we're talking about when it comes to ongoing trauma. So if I stay the way I am, I'm going to have ongoing pain that's never going to go away. I'm going to have unmet needs that are never going to get met. So I better be the one that changes. So it's adapt, adapt. But to do that, and here's the painful part we're going to look into tonight, the child has to murder their own soul. So to survive physically, I got to kill parts of me internally in order to get rid of the pain, in order to survive. And that, I'm going to give you 11 different parts of us the child has to basically murder in order to survive. And that's where, for many people, this, is, this gets painful because when you begin to look at that, it's like, wow, to survive physically, I did basically destroy myself in a bunch of different ways. And that is not fun to look at, but it's the reality, the sad reality of trauma. So let's start with the unmet needs part so just we've talked about the 12 needs before so the need for love the child comes in with this great drive and need to be authentic to be respected and valued to be safe to be accepted to fit in and belong to be around people who regulate their emotions well to get validated so in a healthy home what happens when a child's need is not met? So think of their need for food. They are hungry, so they cry. So they become dysregulated once that need is not met because they are in a certain amount of pain because of an unmet need. So they are dysregulated, they cry, or they're a bit older, they ask for the need to be met. They put themselves out there and say, could I have this? Could you meet this need? Healthy parents come right in and they meet the need. And as soon as the need is met, the child becomes regulated. The child becomes happy. Everything is good. It's resolved. That need is gone. It is resolved. And so that is the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's designed when a child has an unmet need. But what happens when a child has an unmet need, they cry out, they ask for it, and it doesn't get met. And rather, instead of getting met, they might even get 
punished for crying or for asking for it. They might get told they're selfish. They might get told to suck it up. They might get more pain added to the existing pain. So what does the child then do? Because this need is not getting met. They go, it must be my fault. I need to be the one that changes so that mom and dad will meet my need. So I will adapt. So what then does a child do? They wear masks. They adopt roles. And we talked about this very briefly, but let me give them the, the main roles that children will adapt when their needs aren't being met to try to get their needs met. So the first one is a child who says, I will become a hero. I will become the perfect child. And so I will take care of everybody's needs. I will be super responsible. I'll get straight A's at school. I will excel at everything. And their whole focus becomes doing everything perfectly. Pleasing mom and dad, being the super people pleaser. And so they do all of that. That's their adaptation. And the hope is if I adapt this way, then mom and dad are going to say, oh, that's a good kid. I will meet their needs. And they will get their needs met. Some children... They go, that's too much work. I'm going to just be funny. I'm going to be the entertainer, the mascot. I'm going to keep everybody laughing and get everybody to like me because I tell jokes constantly. I'm constantly telling wonderful stories. And so when everybody likes me so much, they're just going to want to meet my needs. So they adapt. Now, just think about what happens to that hero child who does everything perfectly, super excels at everything, what happens when they become an adult? So that worked maybe for them as a kid. It got their needs kind of met. But then they become an adult, and they think they still got to be perfect. They got to excel at everything. They burn themselves out. They soon have a resentment towards everybody and everything because everybody always wants something, and they have to please everybody and they don't know how to say no, and it wears them right out. What happens to that mascot comedian once they become an adult? They don't know how to have healthy relationships. How do you get serious? How do you open up? How do you become vulnerable? You gotta be funny all the time. And so it backfires. So it seemed to work as a child, so that adaptation becomes a maladaptation, is what I want you to see in adult life. The other thing that some children did, the other major role is to become an invisible child or a lost child, it gets called. And what that means is, okay, maybe I'm too needy. Maybe I should just not have needs. I will never ask for anything. I will cut myself off and just stay by myself all the time so nobody notices me. That way I'll never cause a problem. That way I'll never get mom and dad upset. I will become as small as I can. And that's their adaptation. But once they become an adult, they don't know how to ask for their needs. They don't know how to have a relationship. And so it becomes a maladaptation again. But the next thing I want you to understand about these adaptations is they had to change who they really were and become something else. They had to play a role. They had to wear a mask. And so that means they became less and less who they really were. They became more and more what they thought others wanted them to be or needed them to be. And after a while, they don't even know who they really are anymore. And so they lose that sense of authentic and feel more and more like an imposter. So what happens sadly within complex trauma is some children adapt and they kind of get their needs met. But what happens deeper than that is now they have an idea that it was my fault. I really am bad. I have to always be fake to get anybody to notice me. So shame becomes the driving force. 
Secondly, love has to be earned. There's no such thing as unconditional love. Love has to be earned, and that's the bottom line. So the two very key things, their identity and love, get distorted because of that. But for some, the other tragedy becomes this. They adapt, and their needs still don't get met. They adapt again, and they get their hopes up. Maybe my needs will get met again, and they still don't get met. They adapt again, and they adapt over years and years, multiple ways, and their needs still don't get met. So what we have seen is right around 12, 13, if they've adapted, 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 needs still aren't met, they shut her down. They harden themselves. They go, screw this. Screw trying to please people. Screw trying to earn love. I don't need anybody. And they turn anger. They turn self into self-pity. They turn into blaming everybody. And that becomes their way of life. And so that's where some turn to drugs to start just medicating and helping them stay shut down. So they don't have to feel, they don't have to connect with anybody because any adaptation, which is a desire to connect to get your needs met, always results in pain and rejection. So screw it all. Others, they will adapt and they will find an adaptation that seems to get their needs met. So let's say a girl comes into her teens and she finds out that everybody thinks she's drop-dead gorgeous. And everybody gives her attention. People want to buy her stuff. Guys want to take her out. People do stuff for her. And she goes, if I flirt and stay beautiful, I will get my needs met. And that becomes her mentality is thinking This is the way to get my needs met, but I ought to always perform in this area. And so all kinds of people find one thing that seems to get their needs met, but what you can begin to realize, it doesn't really get their needs met. It just seems to work for a little while and causes problems later in life. So here's a very quick test for you that you can do on yourself. So I'm going to quickly go through a bunch of these needs. See if you can quickly in your mind, if you had to do an adaptation as a child to get this need met. Okay? So for safety, if some of you didn't feel safe, what did you have to do to feel safe? So for some of you, you just never spent time at home. You just were always somewhere else, playing. Others, you became super angry or super tough. So you adapted to try to find safety because you weren't safe just as you were. Connection. You tried to connect with dad. You tried to connect with mom. They were too busy. They were angry. They once in a while connected, but not consistently. They weren't attuned to you. But you're desperate to connect. So how did you adapt? Maybe you tried to do chores for them. Maybe you tried to be funny. Maybe you tried to do some type of thing that gave feelings of connection. If I play sports with dad, even though I hate sports, he is all of a sudden proud of me and wants to spend time with me. So those, what did you do to adapt? And then some kids just never were understood. The parents said, you need to hear what I have to say. They never cared what you had to say. And you need to do it my way. They didn't care about hearing your opinion. So some people who never felt understood, and that's a massive need, they adapted by, I'll become super smart. Then everybody will listen to me. Or I will talk nonstop in every situation and I'll over-explain everything. Then people will listen to me. An adaptation. So how are you doing? So then you go to validation, feeling loved, all of those needs. Did you do adaptations? Being authentic, if that wasn't allowed to you, how did you adapt? Growing control. So a child, a baby, is totally dependent and parents are in total control. But as they get older, 
parents give them more and more freedom to make decisions. So first they can dress themselves, then they can decide what game they want to play, etc. And they get more and more autonomy as they grow older, so that by the time they leave home, they're able to make decisions well for themselves. But what happens with a parent who doesn't let a child develop that growing autonomy, but is afraid a child might make a bad mistake, and so they super hyper control everything about that child? Well, that child begins to rebel to get some space to be a child, to allow themselves to grow up. What happens once they start to rebel? The parent says, no, no, you're not going to rebel. Uh-uh. And they tighten control. And then the child rebels even more, trying to get some space to grow up. And the parent tightens control even more. And so then what comes out of that is what is now diagnosed as oppositional defiance disorder. And that is whatever you say do, to say to do, I'm going to do the opposite. Just because you said to do this, I will do the opposite. And so that adaptation is their only way to try to allow themselves to grow up. Some who are never given ability to make decisions, their way of trying to gain some control is OCD, obsessive compulsive. I'll just go organize my little world over and over again because that gives me a feeling of control. And so that can become an issue for some. If you weren't allowed boundaries, mom just barged into your room, read your diary, people were always in your business and didn't give you any space, then for some people, they adapted by, I will isolate or I will use anger to keep people away. Because nobody listens to my no. So the only way I can set a boundary is to adapt in those ways. So again, you can see that adaptation when you get to adult life, if you're angry all the time, or if you isolate because you don't know how to say no, it's not going to work for healthy relationships. So those adaptations. And then all of the emotions, if you aren't able to resolve fear or anger or depression or grief or hurt or false guilt or stress, how did you adapt? So that's something you can just do or even discuss it with somebody you're close to and compare notes on that. I think you'll find it informative. But here's the sad part. That adaptation, complex trauma, you had to do it over and over and over again because your situation didn't improve. And so because you did it over and over again, it then became part of your subconscious programming in your brain. It became your way of operating your default setting in your brain. So now as you get to adult life, it becomes the program your brain normally wants to operate by. And it's now maladaptive and it messes you up. And so again, to survive, the child only had the option of adapting. But those adaptations, sadly, today are messing up life. And that is, to me, one of the sad tragedies of complex trauma. Okay, so let's go to this unresolved pain, the need to survive in a dangerous environment. And we're going to get into this adaptation of having to start to shut down the internal part of me. So in order to keep safe physically, I had to shut down emotions, I had to shut down internal stuff, all to stay safe physically. So another way to look at this is, if you look at a child, the beauty of a child is they just come into the world as they are, and they show up authentic, who they are, their personality. And if you look at those basic instincts to open up, to be vulnerable, to love, to share, all of those things, you go, those are beautiful instincts. And they show all of their emotions, their happiness, their sadness, 
their grief. It all is shown. But what we're going to see is they had to start shutting down all of that basic, authentic, beautiful instinct and try to become less human. And so complex trauma takes a child who's fully human and forces them to become less human to survive physically. So there's a quote by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who's one of the leading researchers on trauma. If you ever want to read his stuff, it's really good. But complex trauma is not just about being stuck in the past. It's also about not being fully alive in the present because you're not fully human. So you exist, but you don't fully live. That's what happens with trauma. You exist, but you don't thrive. So a book was written called Soul Murder. And basically, that's what I'm going to develop it's a strong term, and I use it on purpose because, to me, it's exactly what the child had to do to survive. They had to murder parts of their soul. And so I don't say it to be offensive or strong. It's just to really put in the focus with clarity what happens internally inside of a child. So here's the 11 things a child had to do, had to shut down, had to murder in their soul in order to survive physically. So number one is they had to shut down their alarm system. So there's three parts to our alarm system. So if you think about it, it'll make sense once I explain it. So number one, we have a gut feeling. So I don't know if you've ever walked up to somebody and something in your gut just said, danger, danger, something's not right here. You sense something. So you can call it your spidey sense, your internal alarm system, red flags. It's your gut. So picture any child. They have an amazing gut. I love watching little children sometimes when they meet a stranger. And they'll go to one person without blinking an eye. And another one, they'll back away from it. And you go, what in the world is going on that they pick that up? But they do. There's something that senses if a person is safe. So imagine a child growing up in a complex trauma family, and they have an uncle that's a sexual predator, and they, as a little child, they just don't feel safe around this uncle. They don't like this uncle. They avoid this uncle, and they tell mom and dad they don't want to be around this uncle. They're listening to their gut. And mom and dad go, oh, your uncle's wonderful. He's so much fun. And they force the child to spend time with the uncle. And the child cries and gets upset, but the parents don't listen, so the child can't resolve the problem by listening to their gut. They get forced to their uncle and then they get sexually abused. So that's, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of stories like that. Or let's say a child is out with friends and all of a sudden they want to do something that's picking on another kid. And their gut says, no, no, don't go there. Don't go do that. That that would hurt that boy's feelings, and they back away. But then they realize, if I do that, they're going to laugh at me. I won't be part of the group anymore. I'll ignore my gut, and I'll do just so I fit in. So what happens in complex trauma is when that child gets forced to go with the uncle, when you ignore your gut, Eventually you go, I'm tired of feeling my gut bothering me all the time and I can't do anything about it. So I'm going to just shut my gut down. I don't want to hear from it. I don't want any alarms going off because I can't do anything about it. So what's the point of having it? So they 
find a way to harden themselves to their alarm system of their gut. And so that's why for people coming out of complex trauma, they walk back into a relationship where they get abused. And they repeat the trauma. Why? Because when they met the person, if they didn't have their trauma, they would have had their gut saying, danger, danger, don't go with that person, but they've shut their gut down a long time ago. And they just go with that person and they get traumatized again. And so it's one of the tragedies. So that's the first alarm system is our gut. The second one is our conscience. So what happens sadly within complex trauma is that you have to lie in order to survive. You don't care about the morals of lying or not lying. You care about surviving. And so if you're going to get punished for doing something right, and you're going to get punished for doing good stuff, well, you're going to lie about stuff just so you don't get punished. So you learn to lie to avoid getting hurt. Well, that and your conscience starts bugging you. Well, I don't want to listen to that conscience because I got to lie. So let's shut my conscience down because it's doing me no good. It's not helping me survive. It's adding to my pain. And so you shut down your conscience. You harden yourself to your conscience. So there's your second alarm system that you've shut down. And then the third one is your emotions. So one of the reasons your emotions are given to us is to give us sensations about what's happening in our external world. So if I'm in a dangerous situation, what emotion comes? Fear. And fear gives me sensations that say, get out of there. So emotions are designed to be this, this alarm system that alerts us to our external environment and what is happening in it. But let's say you grow up and you are being treated unjustly every day by dad. You are angry about it, but nobody cares and they get, you get punished for being angry. And then you're afraid all the time, but nobody is fixing your situation, but they punish you for being afraid. And then you're crying because you're so upset and then you get punished for crying. That's a bunch of negative emotions that you're trying to resolve that only end up in more pain. And you can't resolve those negative emotions. So what does your brain say? Emotions are stupid. Who needs emotions? Let's shut down emotions, stuff emotions, disconnect from emotions, because emotions are no good. They don't help at all, because you can never resolve them, and they only result in more pain. So all three alarm systems got shut down. And now you go into adult life without any alarm system. And the other part to the emotions that causes people to shut it down is that when you are surviving in survival mode, you can't show weakness. Because if you show weakness, somebody's going to take advantage of you, somebody's going to hurt you. And so you begin to go through, what makes me weak? Oh, vulnerability, crying, showing fear, showing soft emotion. Oh, yeah, there's another reason why emotions are bad. Let's shut them down. And so that's just number one. But do you realize how much damage got done just by number one being shut down? All the alarm systems. So now you go into adult life vulnerable to getting re-traumatized because you have no alarm systems to warn you. The second thing is the authenticity. And this one to me is so sad. So a child comes into the world, like I said, naturally authentic. 
They're just themselves. They're real. But they have a second desire, a second competing drive, and that is to connect. Right from birth, the child wants to connect with mom, with dad. Connection is just built into us with great power. So what happens if you go to connect with mom or dad and you get rejected? The child concludes it must be my fault, so it must be because I'm the way I am. Being authentic is the reason why I was rejected. So authenticity does not lead to connection like I thought it would. Authenticity leads to lack of connection, to rejection. Therefore, if I want connection, and that's the stronger of the drives, I must kill my authenticity. And I must become something different. And that's where the mass and the roles come in. So one of the very first things to get murdered within a child is authenticity with complex trauma. Now here's how it often happens. It's at a little at a time. It's not all at once. So I've had many clients recount to me in detail where they were told from an early age, get a smile on your face. And if you don't get a smile on your face soon, I'm going to give you something to cry about. And that was what they heard. And so it was basically, you got to have only one emotion, be happy all the time. And so they hated themselves that they were so sensitive. They hated themselves that they cried a lot. So they just, oh, I just wish I could cut that part of myself out and throw it away because I hate that part of myself. So they murdered that part of themselves. And then they got made fun of because they were so shy and introverted. Because everybody in their family said, the only fun people in the world are extroverts. Introverts are boring. And they go, I hate that I'm an introvert. And they murdered that part and they tried to be an extrovert. And then they got in trouble because they were angry so much. And I hate that I'm such an angry person. And they murder that part of themselves. And so what they begin to do is murder piece by piece whatever got the latest rejection until they were less and less human. And that is massive for many people. So the next one ties in with what we just said is that connection, but it goes deeper than that, and it's intimacy. So if you think of healthy, authenticity equals connection. Complex trauma, authenticity equals no connection. Wow, okay. So I still want connection, but nobody that's significant in my life seems to be available to connect with me. So I conclude it's my fault. I get hurt. But if that continues to happen, I get to the point where I go, who needs connection? I can just survive on my own. Who needs close relationships? I will have sexual relationships. I will have fun relationships. I will have relationships that got lots of warm feelings, of feeling in love, but I'm not going to open up and I'm not going to truly connect at a deep level because that's no way. So what they basically say is intimacy, true intimacy is off the table. It's not necessary. I'm not going to allow it. And that goes even further is if I'm the screw-up that nobody wants to connect with, I don't even want intimacy with myself. So they kill connecting to themselves. They kill connecting truly with others. And it's like every relationship now is gone that has any depth and meaning. 
And that is such a huge, huge loss. Number four, told you this could get heavy, trust. So a child comes into the world totally dependent, totally needing people who have strength and power, who care for them to take care of them. So they come into the world naturally trusting individuals. They totally trust, naturally. They don't have to be taught how to trust. If you put a little child on, a, on the roof and say, jump, they jump because they, they trust dad's going to catch me. That is just built into them. But what happens if the child's on the roof and dad says, jump, and the child jumps and dad doesn't catch them? Well, they go, must have been my fault. So dad puts them back on the roof and says, I'll get you this time, jump, and dad doesn't catch them again. They go, well, really must have been my fault. I, I need to do something different. But play that out. That every time they trust somebody, they get let down. They trust again, they get let down. They think it's their fault, they get their hopes up, they trust again, they get let down. They get to a point where they go, not trusting another human being in my life. Even if it was Jesus saying, jump off the roof. Nope, not a hope. Because trust equals pain. Trust equals getting hurt. So trust is now murdered from my soul. What is one of the foundations for a healthy, intimate relationship? Well, you got to be authentic. you got to connect at an intimate level, and you got to trust. What has been murdered in complex trauma? Authenticity, intimacy, connection, and trust. The three main foundation blocks of healthy adult relationships. Truth. So we already talked about that in many complex trauma homes, kids have to lie to avoid getting hurt, to avoid getting punished, so lies become absolutely necessary for them to survive. And if you want to just think of a kind of a modern example of that, you can think of the times of World War II with Hitler, where Hitler's wanting to wipe out Jews and, and people are saying, no, I'm going to hide Jews. Well, all of a sudden, you've got to tell lies in order to save these people. And, and so lies become necessary in environments where people are violating love as a way of life. And so lies become part of that, but it goes further. Many complex trauma families there's all kinds of issues dad's angry all the time there's disrespect happening there's lots of hurtful things being said there's betrayal there's lack of justice but nobody will talk about it and so if a child tries to say hey that wasn't fair or can we talk about this nobody and then there's secrets well, dad did this, but don't tell anybody. Well, mom's this way, but don't tell everybody she can't go to work because she's so drunk. Secret, secret, secret. And so what's happening in complex trauma is a child is being constantly being told the truth, don't go there. We live in lies. And we learn to tell lies. We learn to believe lies. And we learn to keep secrets. So what does, happens for many kids is then in their internal world to tell the truth to themselves, my family's screwed up, my dad doesn't love me, my mom's too busy for me, that's too painful. So who even wants to tell the truth to themselves? So they start lying to themselves and escape to a fantasy world of make-believe. So the truth gets killed over and over in many different ways. And that's why somebody said the greatest sources of our suffering are the lies we tell ourselves. So truth becomes sacrificed. And that's why one of the characteristics of complex trauma 
is even in adult life, many continue to lie when it would have been just as easy to tell the truth. Then the next one is needs. And so I've already kind of explained this a bit, but let me just take it further. What happens for many children when your needs aren't met repeatedly and repeatedly is you begin to say, I will not have needs. My life will be about serving others. And so I will just do without. I will sacrifice, sacrifice, give up my needs, put my needs aside, and just take care of others, thinking that that's going to make them happy. Now, there's a wee bit of truth in that, but it's got to be in balance. And so, for many people, they try to live repeatedly by denying their own needs. And it is so sad because there's just an emptiness inside, there's a pain inside, there's a constant discontent that's deep down inside that's always there. But then when they get to adult life, what they find is they can walk into a room and they can be attuned to everybody else's needs in the room. They just don't have a clue what their own needs are because they've never taken stock and listened to themselves to learn what their own needs are. And it is a huge loss for them. And for many, it takes a long time to relearn that. The next one doesn't happen with everybody. This comes out of more severe trauma, but is you have to kill empathy to survive because empathy is a sign of weakness. Empathy people will take advantage of. Empathy people will use you and manipulate you and hurt you if you have empathy. And so a common thing that we look for in troubled children is do, are they destructive of property and do they harm animals? And, and those are two major signs that empathy has been killed. They just don't care about anybody else or anything else. Now, for many in complex trauma, they don't have em empathy towards humans because humans have only hurt them, but they have loads of empathy towards animals because animals have always been there for them. But in more severe trauma, they even lose the empathy to animals and they start to harm animals. And so that is a huge loss because what replaces that is just a bitterness, a hatred, a deep anger that's there all the time. And it just makes for impossible, healthy relationships. Next one, creativity. Don't know if you have thought of this one. When you are, just picture yourself in, in a war zone in a gangland neighborhood. You don't got time to sit and go, hmm, what am I going to do with my spare time today? Maybe I should take up a new hobby. No, you're going, is anybody going to shoot me today? Who's going to be on the corner? Are they going to bully me today? your brain is focused totally on have I thought everything through enough so I can survive? So creativity gets sacrificed when you're in survival mode. And so you don't have time to explore hobbies. You don't have time to just relax and do whatever you feel like doing. For some people, they think, why? didn't lose creativity, I went into fantasy world. That's not necessarily creativity. That's, for them, that was an escape from the real world. And they didn't develop their skills and their assets. So creativity usually gets sacrificed. And then for many, spirituality. And so I've heard, again, hundreds and hundreds of these stories where people were dad was a violent drunk and they prayed or somebody was sexually abusing them and they prayed begging God to help them to stop it and it doesn't and eventually they go screw that I'm done with it and that has to get killed to survive because 
if they were to allow that to continue, it would keep them hoping that maybe, maybe, maybe something will improve. And it's like, no, that's too painful. So let's kill that. And then the hope. So again, the child that adapted got their hopes up that my needs are going to get met. I'm going to be safe. Didn't happen. Adapt again. Get their hopes up. Going to get my needs met. Going to be safe. Didn't happen. A child has an amazing capacity to adapt and keep hoping. And they will do that for years and years, but eventually they go. There's two problems here. I get hurt every time, and my hopes get crap, dashed every time. And my hopes getting dashed is just as painful as getting hurt. So you know what? I'm going to stop hoping ever. Never get your hopes up because you'll just get disappointed. So you kill hope in your life. So now what do you do when you get to adult life and you get into a good job or a good relationship with a healthy person and things are going well? Do I get my hopes up? Uh 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 uh. No way. Let's sabotage this relationship. Let's sabotage this job because I know how to deal with that. I don't know how to deal with getting my hopes up. So hope gets destroyed. And then the final one for many, sadly, they had to kill all their dreams. So part of childhood is I want to be a policeman. I want to be a soldier. I want to be a fireman. I want to and you dream and you dream in complex trauma, every opportunity slowly gets taken away and your dreams die. And you have to stop dreaming because it hurts too much to have your dreams die. So those are the 11 things that sadly a child has to kill within themselves in order to survive. But sadly, we're not done because there's some collateral damage. So you know what happened as you killed all those things? You become less human, but that means you lose your innocence. And what does com complex trauma do? It takes away a child's innocence. And that's huge collateral damage. But then, because you think everything's your fault, and you're constantly adapting, and you don't know who you are, you get more insecure, you lose your confidence, that's a huge collateral damage. You go from living a full life of joy, enjoying having all your needs met, to just existing. And existing is not joy. But that's collateral damage. So joy and peace is gone, because now you're in constant emotional pain, constant need, constant hurt. Joy and peace collateral damage. Your sense of value is gone because you're not loved and your needs aren't met just because you're you. You have to try to earn everything and your needs still aren't being met so you go, I must be truly of no value. Shame is a huge thing. And then with that, because you have to do things to survive that you know you shouldn't be doing, more and more you lose your self-respect. And that becomes collateral damage. And then for many people, what comes out of that is you try and try, you adapt and adapt, and it doesn't work, and you feel helpless to change your situation. You are truly a victim of unfortunate situation that you cannot fix, and that helpless feeling can now go into adult life where you go, I can't do anything to better my life. I feel still helpless. I still feel like a victim. And that is a massive issue, collateral damage. And then you go from not just rebelling against your parents and not trusting them, you go to, I don't trust any authority. I, I don't want to follow any authority because every authority has let me down. And so now, that's collateral damage. So that's a lot of stuff. Okay, so let me very quickly go, how do we heal from this? So what I hope you realize 
is that recovery from trauma is a very slow, gradual process of becoming human again. It's breathing life back into my emotions. It's retraining my alarm systems and my gut. It's learning to trust again, learning to connect again, learning to be authentic again. You don't do that overnight. When all of your messages is say, don't go there because you're going to get hurt again, that's a very gradual, slow process. But it's the process of becoming human again because you had to become less human to survive. But then, secondly, it's saying, I can no longer be a victim. I am not helpless. I now have tools. I now have support. I now must learn how to meet my needs, stand up for myself, express my needs, and take ownership for my life. I am not that helpless child anymore. That is a very important but challenging step for many. And so that involves, I need to learn how to manage my emotions. I need to learn how to think and concentrate and plan. I need to learn how to deal with my triggers that are going to come up. I need to learn how to connect, and learn how to find joy and peace in my life. I have to start being honest with myself and connecting with myself. I have to stand up for myself and take responsibility. So there's a ton of more stuff we can cover in this. I just really wanted you to kind of get the picture that this trauma thing, we've looked at how it affects our immune system, how it affects our central nervous system, how it affects our brain, our bodies. But tonight was how it affects your soul. And that is part of this slow process of healing. So I hope that helps 